Let's open up our Bibles to 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. We're going to talk about false teachers again. And, um, and I, I say this because Peter spends a lot of time in addressing false teachers, and we're going to spend a lot of time addressing false teachers. And, and it's not so much because I want to necessarily, but it's just we're preaching through 2 Peter, and Peter spends a lot of time on talking about false teachers. And it's very prevalent in this day and time. This, this applies to us today. Uh, and, and not only uh, Peter talking about it, but Jude, is, there's a lot of similarities between the book of Second Peter and the book of Jude. And, and so they're addressing a lot of the same things, what we do with false teachers. Now, and, and I also say this, that doesn't mean uh, you have to agree on everything with me. All right? Uh, it doesn't mean that we all have to agree on everything. We were studying in Romans 14 on Wednesday nights that, you know, we have liberty in some things. Uh, and, and we're not to be stumbling blocks to others in that we hold different beliefs, but there are some that are essential. And that's the false teachers that we're going to talk about today and throughout the rest of this time is that those who pervert the gospel of Christ. And, and when you pervert the gospel, that's what's destructive. And, and that's what we see that Peter's addressing. But when you, if you're there, please stand. We'll honor the reading of God's Word, Second Peter chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this morning. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the truth of your word. We're thankful for the availability of your word, that we all have the standard of truth, and that is your holy Bible, your holy word. And Lord, I pray that we lean on that, and I pray that we trust in what you say, and we don't lean on our own understanding. Lord, this morning I pray that what is said uh, reaches receptive hearts. Lord, that your word goes and becomes a part of us. Lord, that when we go outside these doors, that that's what we practice, that's what the world sees. And Lord, we just give you all the praise, we give you all the glory, and we thank you for your grace and your mercy and your son Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So, Peter warns, as there were prophets of old, and we covered a little bit of this last week, as there were prophets of old uh, that spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They spoke the Word of God. So as, you know, there were prophets of God, there were false prophets. Prophets that spoke from their own flesh. All right? They spoke what they wanted to say. They spoke for personal gain. When you compare prophets of the Old Testament, you have people like Jeremiah who lost everything because he was speaking the Word of God. And then you had false prophets that would get rich over telling people what they wanted to hear. You know, telling people uh, that would, things that would benefit themselves. And listen, you preach the gospel. You preach the true Word of God. You know, materially, there's not a whole lot of benefit. You know, there's not a whole lot of benefit for the flesh, but there's a whole lot of benefit for the soul. But, but Peter's saying just as there was false prophets in the Old Testament, there's going to, as there were false prophets then, there's going to be false teachers now. And, and it's sad to say, but listen, there's a lot of people in the church that don't heed these warnings. We don't put a lot of thought into who are false teachers or, or the, the destructive things that they may say. And it's rampant in this day and time. I appreciate Wednesday night at our men's meeting. We spent a lot of time talking about false teachers. And I think it's good because it goes right along with Second Peter 2 and what we'll be studying. But it's rampant in this day and time. And the problem is, because there's a couple problems, there's a lot of people in church, they don't think it's a big deal. And then there's a lot that's just too biblically illiterate to know the difference. And then there's a lot that, well, they just don't listen to enough teaching to hear much false teaching. 
And, and that's the thing. See, I, and I'm not saying you have to do what I do, but here's what I do every day. I listen to at least two sermons in the morning before I leave the house. And, and it's, not, it's not to help my sermons or anything like that. It's because I need that. I need to hear the teaching of God's Word all the time. I, I, I need that in my life. And when you look to hear this teaching, you're going to run across some false teachers. And, and they distort the truth of Christ. I, I know Brother Tony, and I, I didn't sit in for the lesson this morning, but I know he was talking about um, his drawing from an article in a magazine put out by Franklin Graham, and the article's title was The Problem with Our Pulpits. What's being taught and, and having a biblical worldview. And that's an issue in this day and time. I mean, there's people that I've heard, they'll stand up and they'll preach a message, but it won't be one from the Bible because they're up there for their own self. And and that manifests itself in a lot of different ways. But when someone distorts the truth of Christ, it harms the body of Christ. And when you look at Scripture, Peter, Paul, James, Jude and Jesus all warned of false teachers. Every single one of them. And, and to me, that gives credence that we ought to pay attention to it. We, we, ought to, we ought to look for this. Now, I'm not saying sit down for a message and try to pick out everything you think is wrong. But be aware. When, when those things are said, uh, those things that are false, that go against God's Word, then you ought to be aware of that. And so we can't take these warnings lightly. And, and so as the body of Christ, and I, I heard a message the other day, this, um, this pastor I listened to a lot, he said at their church, they spend a lot of time on proclaiming and protecting the truth. Okay, they proclaim the truth, protect the truth. So much so that, which is a big church, and there are several pastors there, they write papers for each other on different doctrinal issues. Now, I'm not going to ask my elders to do that. But we all need to know the Bible. We need to know the truth. And when we know it, we need to proclaim it. We protect it like it talks about in Jude 3, contend for the faith. And then to add to that, we need to practice it. And that's the thing. That's what we'll see a lot of with these false teachers. They may be aware of the truth of Scripture. Or people, us in here, aware of the truth in Scripture. And we need to practice it. You know, it's one thing to know what the Bible says. It's another completely different to live it. Okay, every one of us know, generally speaking, the truth of the Word. We know what God requires for us. And the simple thing to do would be to follow that, but a lot of us don't live that life. We don't live the truth as we know it. But getting here into 2 Peter... I'm going to jump ahead to 2 Peter 3.16. Peter's referring to Paul in, in, in a lot of his writings. And he says, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. And so there are many who would rest, or literally means adulterate the Scriptures, pervert the Scriptures. And we may ask ourselves, why and who? Why would they personally distort the Scriptures? Now, we look at, say, the temptation of Jesus. What did Satan do? He twisted the Scriptures to try to make Jesus fail. And we see that as well in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, read verses 13 through 15, he says... For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now there are many that claim to do the Lord's work, but what they are actually doing is they're doing the work of Satan. Because they're trying to destroy the body of Christ. And what Paul is talking about here in 2 Corinthians, he says, some of these false apostles, false teachers, are demons. Because he says, don't be surprised because Satan can 
transform himself into an angel of light. And so he says, therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers or if his demons are transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Not just a wolf in sheep's clothing, but a devil in an apostle's clothing. Devil in an angel's clothing. And look, I, I've had these conversations with some. One of the false teachers we looked at Wednesday night was Kenneth Copeland. And there's one interview. He looks absolutely demonic. And, and this ain't just me speaking by myself. That pastor that I talked to yesterday, he said the exact same thing. You know, and, and so you can't help but think that demons are pushing these heresies. And, you know, the Bible talks about the doctrines of demons. What does that mean? It means it's doctrines that come from the pit of hell. They come from Satan. And too many times we entertain these things in our ears. And we listen to them. And we don't put in enough effort to either correct it or disregard it as we need to. But these false teachers, they bring in damnable or destructive heresies. And so that's what it says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. It says... There shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies. Damnable means destructive. And heresies here, as it's used, it literally means factions or divisions. And so what is one of Satan's tactics? He wants to divide the body of Christ. You know, what is what has Satan used in this country to rot and decay and deteriorate this country? They divide the family, right? And divide the church. Look, there's, and this has been on my mind lately, and I talk about this a lot. There's a hundred churches in this county, and there is no reason for that because we should all be able to gather together. If we're truly in the body of Christ, we should be able to gather together. But there's some that will not gather with others. And then there's some they are just lost because they're teaching heresies. They're teaching doctrines of demons. But these heresies, these factions, these divisions... It's, it's mentioned in Galatians 5, verse 20, as one of the works of the flesh. Remember, in Galatians 5, we have the works of the flesh. And then you have the fruit of the Spirit, and they're contrasted. And so in Galatians 5, 20, it mentions idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. And again, is Satan's attempt to divide the body of Christ and to turn people away from sound doctrine. And, and you remember, as I taught last week, Paul, in his pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, really spends a lot of time on telling them, look, focus on sound doctrine. In Titus 2, 1, it says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And sound means healthy. Life-giving doctrine. And there's no better life-given doctrine than the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of salvation, the gospel. But there's a lot of false teachers that would pervert that. But now Paul, real quick, tells us how to address these false teachers, how we are to react to them. In Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions... Okay, that's just like heresies there. Which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. They serve the God of their belly, and it says, by good words, fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. They sound good. You know, they may have a, a good vocabulary. They may be well spoken. But they're leading a lot of people to hell. And so we are to mark them. And it literally means to watch out for them. We need to be aware. But then it says, avoid them. Because I talk to several people. And we'll talk about false teachers. And they'll say, and they'll mention listening to one. I say, I don't think you need to be listening to them. And they say, well, I can weed out the bad and keep the good. But it's like I said earlier, some of us are not mature enough to do that. Some of us are not paying attention enough to do that. And, and so 
there are some things that Peter points out in 2 Peter that we are to look for. So how we are to watch out for them and mark them so we can avoid them. So first, it says that they will privately bring in these heresies. He says, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies. In other words, they will introduce them secretly. There's a lot of groups. If a Jehovah's Witness knocks on your door, what they're going to do is they're going to give you some verses, usually from what I've seen, about heaven, okay, and how great it will be to be there. I have no problem with that. However, they're not going to volunteer that they don't believe Jesus is God. They're not going to volunteer that they don't believe in the Trinity. I had some knock on my door one day, and I always say this, don't, don't run Jehovah's Witnesses off. You have people knocking on your door that are lost and want to talk about Jesus Christ, you tell them the gospel. But I got to talking to some, and until I pressed them, they didn't didn't want to talk about the Trinity. They didn't want to show that that's how they differed. They want to call themselves Christians. They're not. Because if you get the doctrine of Christ wrong, the way, the truth, the life, God incarnate, then you've got the gospel wrong. Jesus Christ is God. And, and I, I told this to the church on Wednesday night. I don't know if it was last week or no, it wasn't last week, but it was at some point. And, and I, I learned this just not too long ago. And I thought it was awesome. So we believe in the Trinity. Jesus is God. And there's a lot of people that want to separate Jesus from the God of the Old Testament. And... There's one pastor I listen to. He says, they're one and the same. When you look at all the judgment in the Old Testament, you know, Jesus was not absent. He was there and in agreement. And in Jude, verse 5, he says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Now, the Greek word for Lord typically is kurios. That's not the word that's used there in Jude verse 5. It's the word, the Greek word, for Jesus. And so it literally is Jesus having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed them that believed not. That is literally what it says. Jesus delivered and Jesus destroyed. Jesus was there. Jesus is God. But again, Jehovah's Witnesses and and some other groups will not volunteer that. That They'll secretly, they'll they'll bring you in with something that's the truth and then spring it on you later and then sometimes people, they're just too deep in. I've talked to a lot of people that are stuck in traditions or stuck in in cults. It's hard to get out once once you're in that deep. And, And so... Like Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't want you to learn anything outside of what they teach you. Because then you might realize they're wrong. And, and I see this with preachers on, on TV. I use this example as well. The Ten years ago, I was laid up with a broke leg because I was dumb and got it stuck in a tiller. You know, So I had a lot of time sitting on the couch. And so I was watching a lot of preaching and a lot of old westerns. And some of this preaching I was watching, it was Creflo Dollar. He come on and gave a great sermon. First time I'd ever heard him. It's Galatians 4, and it's talking about the allegory of Sarah and Hagar, and talking about the law, and talking about works, and and grace. And it was great. I was like, I'm I'm looking forward to hearing him again the next day. And then the next day, I turn it on, and some of the words out of his mouth were, all right, you don't need to pay attention at all to the Ten Commandments. He literally said that. I said, well, I'm done. That's it. I hadn't listened to him again. And he's one of the ones that showed up on the false teachers that we talked about Wednesday nights. You know, because at one time he was pressing his congregation to give so much money so he could buy a $65 million jet to help him spread the gospel. Look, you've got all kinds of places around to spread the gospel without buying a $65 million jet. We spread the gospel all over the world, but there's a lot of gospel that needs to be preached here as well. But uh, they bring in these things secretly. 
They give you enough truth to lure you in. And then they tell you a falsehood and you believe the other, so a lot of times you believe the falsehood. Secondly, all right, so it says they shall privately bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. And I, I was talking to Charlie Wills last night about, because I was asking him, hey, what are you preaching tomorrow? He said, what are you preaching tomorrow? He's preaching on Mark 14, by the way, if you can find his uh, service on Facebook, that's what he'll be preaching on. But I, I mentioned Second Peter 2 and false teachers, and he mentioned this next verse that I'm fixing to read, and it's 1 John 4, verses 1 through 3. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. This is that spirit of Antichrist. Whereof ye had heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. There's the, not the capital A Antichrist but little Antichrist. Those that are against Christ are already in the world. And they, what they do is they deny Jesus Christ. They deny his deity, what we've already talked about. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. And, and I spoke to the FCA at school Friday, and I emphasize that. Jesus is God. He's the way, the truth, the life. He is the truth. You want to know truth? Jesus Christ. That's true. But they deny his deity. They deny his humanity. That, he's, that he came and had to live a sinless life in the flesh, came as us. And, and so it, it's hard for us to wrap our mind around truths of Scripture, like the Trinity, for instance. Okay? One God, three persons, it doesn't make sense to our mind. And, and there's a lot of things they're not supposed to because God's ways are above our ways. And then you look at Jesus Christ, he was 100% God, yet 100% man. That does, the math doesn't compute. But it doesn't make it not true. It just means we can't fully understand it. So they deny his deity. They deny his humanity. They deny his death. And they'll say, well, if God is so loving, why did he have to kill his son? Because you had to be saved. That's why. Somebody had to pay for your sin. And so they'll deny what his death means, that it was a substitute for us. And then they deny his resurrection, which goes back to Jesus being God. Romans 1 says that he was proclaimed to be the Son of God with power because of the resurrection of the dead. And that's the great thing about Jesus Christ. Any other religion out there you find, they worship dead people. We don't. Our Lord and Savior is sitting at the right hand of God, alive as, as he has been through all eternity. And he's making intercession for us. So they deny his deity, they deny his humanity, they deny his death and his resurrection. And there are others that would say that they follow Jesus, but then they deny him by their works and their hearts. You know, Jesus chastised uh, the Pharisees and others a lot. He said, look, you honor me with your lips. You talk a good game, but your heart is far from me. You deny me when nobody else is around. You deny me when people aren't looking. You deny me in your thoughts. And like I said, you talk a good game. But your heart's not there. And, and, and then we just, we talk a good game a lot of times and our works show absolutely different. Talk the talk and walk the walk and a lot of us just do not do that. Matthew 7, familiar verses, Matthew 7, 21 and 20, through 23 not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. They talk a good game, right? But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and I will profess unto them I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And something I noticed not too long ago, when you look at those things mentioned, Okay, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out devils? Didn't we do all kinds of many wonderful works or signs and wonders? 
Now, the Antichrist will come and do signs and wonders, if that possible, to deceive the very elect. The Bible tells us that. But one thing that I've noticed, and this has struck me here recently, is a lot of the people that are false teachers, they proclaim to do these things. They claim to prophesy. They claim to cast out demons. They claim to do many signs and wonders. And so, ultimately, a a lot of these that do that, they're lifting up self. You know, it's kind of like uh, Simon the magician in the book of Acts when he saw people receiving the Holy Spirit he says hey I, I, will, I will pay money for you to give me this power and he looked at it as an investment so he could gain money back so he could lift up himself and so ultimately many of these false teachers they deny Christ by lifting up self if you lift up self You're going to deny Christ. They take the opposite approach of John the Baptist. In John 3.30, he says, He must increase, but I must decrease. And the context of of that verse is, look, some people that had been following John the Baptist were leaving John the Baptist and going to follow Christ. And people were worried about it. John said, I'm not. This is who I come to talk about. Please follow them. He must increase, and I must decrease. Now, the next one in verse 2, it says, Many shall follow their pernicious ways. Now, some translations of the Bible will say sensual ways. And and that simply means pleasing the senses. Again, pleasing self. And any elevation of self, and like I said, if you elevate self, you deny Christ. Any elevation of self is enmity with the cross. Look, there's people in this world, they lift themselves up enough that they don't need the cross. I can save myself. I can do good works. I don't don't need the gospel. I don't need God. I don't need a sacrifice for my sins. But they absolutely do. And again, any elevation of self is enmity with the cross. In Philippians 3, 18 and 19, it says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, Okay, so Paul's, these are false teachers that used to walk with Paul. He was weeping over them. He says, I tell you weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. We read that in Romans 16 earlier. Whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. They're sensual. They're pleasing the senses, whether it be the taste, the eyes, the 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 flesh that they're seeking to please those things said they mind earthly things we're all called to mind our heavenly things more than our earthly things but it says who glory is in their shame their sin is what they take glory in pleasing those fleshly lusts and what it says too is people follow them We see that word for sensual or pernicious. We see it used again later on in 2 Peter 2 and verse 7. It says, He delivered just Lot, vexed with filthy conversation. Filthy conversation, same word, of the wicked. Now we know the story of Lot. He was in Sodom. And he's talking about the people of Sodom being sensual. How was they sensual? To fulfill the sexual lust for strange flesh. That was their sensualness. Verse 18 of 2 Peter 2, it says, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh. Because these false teachers lure through the lusts of the flesh. Through much wantonness. That's the sensual or pernicious right there. Those that were clean escape from them who live in error. So the world is naturally sensual and centered on self. The words are used in the book of Jude as well, in 17 through 19, but beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they warned people. He says, how they told you. There should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. So they don't have the Spirit of God, but they fulfill or the lusts of the flesh. And again, the world is naturally centered on self. 
The world is naturally sensual, but it's crept into the church as well. And the, the way I see this especially, uh, if you get on social media, I've seen a lot of posts in Facebook groups. Somebody move into the area and they'll be like, hey, I'm looking for a church. Can someone make a recommendation? Here's what I'm looking for. And there's nothing inherently wrong with asking that question, but here's the thing. The majority of times their requirements, well, it's, it's got to be contemporary or it's got to be this or it's got to be non-denominational. And never, I have never once seen the requirements they need to teach the Bible. Never. And so that's the thing. We, we come to a worship service. Okay, it's called a service. It means we're serving. We come to a service and we want to do it our way. Now, granted, you know, people have tastes and, and, and that's fine. But the first and foremost thing would be that the Bible, the Word of God is preached and God is glorified. That's why we're here. To glorify God, to encourage and strengthen each other. And so you have to ask the question, if people that are making all those requirements, you know, contemporary music or even traditional music or... Um, you know, something to keep my kids busy. You know, because there's some churches, kids under 12 don't sit out and hear the preaching. They play games. That's a shame. We don't teach our kids how to listen to the teaching of God's Word. And then we wonder why they can't do it when they get older. Because we don't allow them to do it. But another way that self has come into the church, um, I talked to this pastor a while back, he'd come into the funeral home. We had a service, a funeral service on Sunday, and somebody in his congregation had a family member that had died. And he walked in, and I said, well, how was the service today? He said, it's always good when I'm involved. That's pretty arrogant. And look, somebody asked me how the service go. I, we were together. We glorified God. We sung songs. It had nothing to do with me. Nothing. It's, it depended on God. Give God the glory. You know, and, and look, I give God the glory every single day. Because look, if there's something that I do that looks like I did a good job, either I was lucky or God was just extremely gracious, and that's probably it. Because I tend to mess things up. I, I use this as an example. The church fans getting worked on. All right, we were supposed to take it September 1st. And I had told Billy on Wednesday before that Friday, I said, you know, I'll, Thursday night I'll take that, I'll get that van over there. Well, Michael sends a text that, hey, the van won't start. And I was like, I was supposed to do that. And I forgot. So, you know, that just goes to show you can't depend on me. But you can depend on God. Because this is what I always tell people. I won't always be around. But one of the greatest promises of Scripture is that Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, and this is one of those things, and I, I meant to say it Friday when speaking to FCA, and it, you know, sometimes I forget things. So maybe they didn't need to hear it, but maybe y'all do. You know, we think, we look at our feelings or have our feelings and the things around us, and it causes us to think certain ways. And sometimes you may feel like you're alone. That's subjective. Your feelings and your emotions, you feel that way. Doesn't mean you are. Because if you're born again, indwelled with the Holy Spirit, God is with you. Jesus Christ is there. You know, when uh, David wrote in the Psalms, when I make my bed in Sheol, when I, when I make my bed in hell, as some translations give it, you are there. That's a great, great truth. But going back, there's a lot of arrogance and self within the church. And so these false teachers and their sensual worldly teaching, what we see a lot of times too is it gives occasion to the world to blaspheme. And, and that's what it says in verse 2. It says that many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall even evil be spoken 
of. Now we see Nathan chastised David for this very same thing in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 14. This was after David's sin with Bathsheba. David was a king ordained, anointed by God, right? He was put in place by God, right? the great psalmist of Israel. But then he sins with Bathsheba and what Nathan tells him. In 2 Samuel 12, 14, How be it, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. You have gave a, an easy account for them to blaspheme the name of God. That's God's man. That's a man of God. Look, I can tell you this, there's all kinds of people out in the world that when somebody who proclaims Christ, when they fall into sexual sin or whatever it may be, the world cheers. They absolutely do. Because they like to talk of Christians as hypocrites, and that's example A, is giving into sexual sin. And so the gospel is reproached the most when those proclaiming to follow Christ fall into the world and its lusts. And, and listen, you, can, you, can, you can't count the number of, of false teachers that proclaim Christ, but yet then they fall into sexual scandals, financial scandals, and the like, and the world cheers because they give occasion for the gospel to be blasphemed. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, talks about these accusations that those who are in Christ would that would come against him. He says, For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You live your life as, as Christ has called you, as Christ has commanded. You put to silence their ignorance, their baseless claims. Now, 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. While some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And it's talking about people who have went after money rather than God. And this is evidence of false teachers. And verse 3 mentions in 2 Peter 2, 3, it says, Through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. And so it mentions their covetousness and making merchandise of their followers. And that's them using their followers for gain. It's the shepherd fleecing the sheep. And James 4.13 uses the same words. And it kind of gives us a better definition, I, I guess a, a more apt uh, illustration. In James 4.13, he says, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, will go into such a city, continue their year, and buy and sell and get gain. Buy and sell and get gain is the same in the Greek as to make merchandise of you as these false teachers do. There's false teachers, believe it or not, that use the people that listen to them to make money, to, to build up their wealth. And some of these false teachers that I've already mentioned, they want these multi-million dollar jets and they live in multi-million dollar houses. And look, they can't be satisfied just to preach the gospel. That's why I want one of the ministries that I follow and listen to is by John MacArthur. I got all kinds of John MacArthur books, and I don't know if I paid for a single one of them because they were given to me. They're not looking to make money off of me. But that's what you see is these people, they go after gain. That's what they're looking for. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5. Perverse disputings of men, corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw yourself. So if anybody teaches that gain is godliness, that godliness is gaining material wealth, Paul tells Timothy, withdraw yourself. And there's a lot of people, they'll, they'll take where Jesus said, I came to give life and give it abundantly. That's not talking about how many vehicles you're going to have or how much money you're going to have in the bank. I have an abundant life and I don't have that much material things. That's what Jesus was talking about. So if someone teaches that financial gain is godliness, Paul says to run. 
And in Titus chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, he says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceiving, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped to subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. That means dirty money. They do it for dirty money. And all of this is indicative of the prosperity gospel, and that mess is everywhere. And I, I heard a pastor recently, and, and look, I have people that I love that are in churches like this. And, and I, this was in a family member's church. A pastor stood up, and he said, and talking about Palm Sunday, he said, you know, the donkey was the Cadillac of Jesus' day, so if Jesus was here today, he'd drive an Escalade. Guess what that preacher drove? An Escalade. Pushing things like that. And we know of specific examples around here. You know, hey, the Lord gave me this watch. We talked about it Wednesday night. To say that godliness is gain, the Bible tells us to stay away. The, and these people will tell you the more godly you are, the more you give to their ministry, the more you'll get. It's not about things. It's about serving Christ. You can serve Christ poor. You can serve Christ wealthy. You can serve Christ healthy. Or you can serve Him while you're sick. Because that's another one that you might hear. It's not the Lord's will to you, for you to be sick. Let's talk to Paul about that. He, he said he had that thorn in the flesh. That was a physical illness. He, he told Timothy, hey, your stomach is bothering you. Drink a little wine to help it. He didn't cast out a demon for him or didn't tell him it wasn't God's will to be sick. I, I use this example in myself. When I had my accident with the tiller, that was from God. <laughs> that was an answer to my wife's prayer. Now, she didn't pray for me to get caught up in the tiller, but she prayed, hey, we need to spend more time together. She got five months with me. She's, yeah, Lord, I'm not going to ask her that again. But listen... You know how much I grew in Christ during that time? I had to slow down, and I had nothing but my family and the Lord. And I grew exponentially. Listen, and there was times, hey, we didn't know if we was going to be able to pay the bills. Because, you know, if you're on short-term or long-term disability, you know, that's not your whole check. And we was living paycheck to paycheck, had all these mouths to feed. Hey, but the Lord provided. The Lord provided. And, and I grew so much during that time. Uh, then there's another heresy that gets pushed. There's some of these, they'll, they'll say that ye are God. They take a scripture, something said by Jesus out of context, and they'll say that we're little gods, you know, little G gods. There, if you know who Paul Crouch is, Paul Crouch founded TBN. And he said, if you are born again, you are just as much the incarnation of God as Jesus Christ was. That's blasphemous. That's putting you at even level with Christ. That's not true. Now, we're still in the flesh. We still deal with sin. But that's just some of the stuff that they preach. And then it says in verse 3 of 2 Peter... It says, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. And we'll get into this more next week, but it talks about their punishment. We need, to, we need to be aware of the false teaching, but listen, the false teachers will get their just rewards. And the Bible tells us this. And again, I'll go into that more later. But I referenced Jude early in, in, earlier in contending for the faith. Jude 3 and 4 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered for the saints. <coughs> contend for the faith. Now, in the context is against false teaching because it goes on in verse 4, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are to contend for the faith, and that is emphasizing that contention is against false teachers. And that goes back to what I said earlier. We need to proclaim the truth. We need to protect the truth. And then we need to practice the truth. We need to live it. We need to honor God with our lips. 
and with our hearts, with our words, with our actions. And this is going back. We need the Bible. We need God's Word. We need to study God's Word. We need to be in God's Word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, that the follower of Christ will be complete. And we see the correction and the reproof. We need the Word of God to do that. And I can't emphasize it enough. And you want to counteract false teaching? Word of God. Be like the Bereans that, that I mention all the time in Acts 17. And so it is imperative. If you are of the truth, and, and Jesus Christ in John 18 says his followers are of the truth. If you are of the truth, you need to stand for the truth. And that truth is Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to proclaim. That's what we need to protect. That's what we need to contend for. Because God has given us a great wondrous thing in his word you we can it, it we can go to anybody if they have a question well let's go to the bible we don't need to give our opinion but there's false teachers out in the world and satan uses them to deceive the sheep those that that follow christ and, and i pray that we take it serious and, and i'll i'll and i pray this if you don't know the truth Look, if you're lost, you have no leg to stand on with false teaching because that's when they'll swoop in and take advantage of you. You need to submit to the Lord Christ. Proclaim Him as your Savior. Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart because that is the only way a man or woman will be saved. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you and praise you again for this blessed day, this opportunity we had to gather together. It truly is a blessing.